most of us are still there. Um, aloha and good morning and welcome everyone to First United Protestant Church of Hilo. Uh, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome to worship with us and I'm so glad to have you here. In today's worship service, we will look at how we are sometimes unprepared and not quite ready for what life has in store for us. We begin this morning with our call to worship. Christ calls us onto the road of discipleship, a road that can be rocky and a mystery at times, one which causes us to stumble and even fall. But with God, we have a place of refuge to rest and regroup. We have a guide who will show us the way. Today we rejoice in God's faithful love. A God who will provide us with the strength we need and show us the signs of hope and life that still lie ahead. We are drawn together to celebrate the life that is ours in Christ Jesus. A life with twists and turns, but a life that can still be lived with grace and beauty. Thanks be to God. Now is our time of daily affirmation. There are three different affirmations. The first will be for us. The second will be for a neighbor or someone near us. And the third will be for our community and our world. The first. God has instilled within me all I need for what comes next in my life. Now we will bravely turn to a neighbor or someone near us and look them in the eyes and affirm for them. God has instilled within you all you will need for what comes next in your life. Now for our community and our world. God has instilled within us all we need for what comes next in our life. Our opening hymn is O oh God, Our Help in Ages Past, number 25 in the New Century Hymnal and included in the back of your worship bulletin. Our peace reading for today 
comes from Olia Barnett, who is a spiritual and self-growth coach. On her website, Positive Sparkles, she says, stop talking yourself out of opportunities because you don't feel like you are ready yet. It's time to jump. You are ready now. Our second piece reading for today comes from Aaron Mankey, who is a writer and storyteller. In his writings, he says, you don't have to have it all figured out at 21 or 30 or even 40. You'll bloom when you're ready. The only thing that matters is never giving up. Our scripture reading for today comes from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 15, where the prophet Elijah's life comes to an end, and the younger Elisha feels not quite prepared to follow in his footsteps. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other, and the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please, let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As he continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen, but when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water. He said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Where is he? He struck the water again, and the water was parted to one side and to the other and Elisha crossed over. When the company of prophets who were at Jericho saw him at a distance, they declared, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. They came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. May the sacred words shared this day be a spark upon my soul. Thanks be to God. If you're just hearing some of these ancient Hebrew stories for the first time, or it's been a while since you remember seeing this text, yes, there are two people in the Bible with very similar names, Elijah and Elisha. 
In case you ever happen to be at a trivia night and the question pops up, yes, they were both biblical prophets. Elijah is the prophet we heard a little bit about last week. The prophet who predicted a major drought, worked miracles like raising a dead person back to life defeated 450 enemies in an epic battle, and fell into a state of deep depression before he regains his strength and musters up the courage to get back out there and continue the journey God still had before him. A journey in which God was going to use Elijah to bring the Israelite people back to faith in God. Elisha is the new person and prophet we're hearing about this week. However, he's not a prophet at the beginning of this story. He's introduced to us as a pupil or a student of the prophet Elisha. He's someone who's been in training, watching and learning from Elisha so that he might one day follow in his master's footsteps. He's the one who's been selected by God to pick up the mantle and succeed his master when he's gone. As us Star Wars fans would say, he's known to us in the story as the Chosen One. Yet what the student, Elisha, soon realizes is that his master is not going to be around forever. His master was soon going to be leaving and would no longer be around to teach, tell, and show the younger Elisha what to do. An event that seemed to cause some stress and anxiety for the young prophet. Upon hearing this news, we gather that the younger Elijah's response, we gather from his response that he's not quite ready to follow in his master's footsteps. He seems to cling as tightly as he can to his master saying, as long as you live, I will not leave you. And when a group of local prophets tell the younger Elisha that God is going to be taking his master away. He says to them, Yes, I know, but I don't want to talk about it. It's almost like he was sticking his fingers in his ears so that he wouldn't have to listen to what the other prophets were saying. Something our three-year-old son does on occasion when he doesn't want to hear us. I think... The older Elijah could feel the younger Elisha's attachment to him. He wanted to spare the pain that it would cause him when he was no longer there, which is why he kept telling him to stay back and stay here. The younger Elijah, however, he just refuses to leave his master's side. He's savoring every last moment with him he can because his master will soon be gone. It was a scary reality for the young prophet to accept because all his master had accomplished was now going to be handed down to him. And all his master had been working on was now going to be falling on his shoulders. As a soon-to-be prophet, he was going to be expected to follow in his master's footsteps. And golly, they were some extremely large shoes to fill. And from what we can gather, the younger Elijah simply did not feel he could fill those shoes. He could never be the prophet Elijah was and do the things that he did. 
He felt he was not ready for the huge responsibility that was going to be handed down to him. Transition. For being ready for what comes next in life is never easy. Whether it's losing a loved one, changing careers, a sudden shift in the way we must now live our life, or the expectation we will assume the work and responsibility of those before us, it produces a certain level of stress and anxiety. Sometimes we know these transitions are coming, and we do our best to prepare ourselves by getting the will and deed ready. We go to school and we train for the profession before us. Or we use the time in between an upcoming date to slowly change ourselves so we're ready to accept a new way of life. Other times, transition is kind of thrust upon us. And we have to kind of figure it out as we go. Employees leave and the bulk of the workload falls on our shoulders. A spouse or partner passes, and it's just us to pay the bills and raise the kids. Or we're hit with an illness, and life just seems to feel sucked right out of us. Whether we know these transitions are coming or not, I don't think we're ever truly ready for such moments. There's always a certain uncertainty about how we're going to make it. Whether we have the right gifts and abilities within us, if we're going to be able to see this thing through till the end. The sense of anxiety and certainty as to whether we're ready for what's coming has hit me at times in my own life. Like when I decided to move out on my own. Was I going to be able to make it without my parents paying the bills and putting food on the table for me? When I decided to become a pastor, was I going to be able to shepherd, care, and love God's people? When I became a father, God, are you really entrusting these two kids and a new baby into my care. Probably not, which is why God gave me a cure. All kidding aside, sorry, a little dry joke. All kidding aside, I can tell you that when these transitions occurred, where I knew they were coming, there was a part of me that felt I wasn't ready. There was a part of me that felt I didn't have it in me. I did not have what it takes to do it on my own. That I did not have what it takes to be a good pastor. Or that I did not have what it takes to be the father these kids will need. And the truth is, in those moments, I looked to those who mentored and shaped me. I clung tightly to the people who believed in me corrected me, nurtured me, and taught me. I held on and remembered the people in my life who saw me, who really saw me. They saw what I was capable of. They recognized not only the gifts that I had, but the ones I didn't. And they still believed God could do great things through me. One of the fascinating moments of this entire scripture is right after the older Elijah took his coat, rolled it up, hit the water, and divided the Jordan River in two, allowing both of them to cross over together on dry ground. It's right after they crossed over, Elijah asked the younger Elijah a question every student probably wishes their mentor would ask. 
And that question was, what do you want me to do for you before I go? Gosh, just think if we could ask that question of our mother or father before they passed. Or if we had the opportunity to ask that question of our favorite teacher before they pushed us out into the world. The younger Elijah, the response to his master's question was, let me have twice your spirit. Let me have twice of what you have. And his master responds by telling him, you have made a difficult request. By asking this, Elijah was in many ways admitting he was not sure he had what it takes to fill his master's shoes, to carry on the work and ministry Elijah was doing. The younger Elijah felt that to be named successor, just knowing that he was chosen by God and next in line, it wasn't enough. He felt to be Elijah's rightful heir and to pick up where he left off, he needed a double portion of his mentor's spirit. For the tide of faithfulness to be turned in the way that his master was doing, he needed twice the spirit that enlivened and empowered Elijah. The younger Elisha, he was unsure of himself. Unsure that he had what it takes to fill the role. That he lacked the spiritual gifts he needed to fulfill the tasks God was going to ask of him. The request was difficult to fulfill because it wasn't up to the older Elijah to determine the prophetic power and spiritual gifts this younger Elijah should have. That was up to God to determine. And it was only God's to give. What he could do, and what he had always done, was show his student the way. So that when he was gone, the younger Elisha would know how to move forward. He would know how to pick up where his master left off. And trust and the spiritual gifts that he was given. A few verses later, after his master is gone, we see the younger Elisha doing just this. We see him coming to the banks of the Jordan River, just like Elisha did. We see him picking up the coat that had fallen from his master. We see him rolling it up, hitting the water, and dividing the river in two, just as his master had done. A moment that finally convinces him the same spirit that rested on Elijah now rests on him. And if we were to continue reading this story, and the chapters that lay ahead of it, we would discover this anxious student who was uncertain about himself and questioned whether he really had what it takes goes on to accomplish great things. He did not just step into his master's shoes. He did not just pick up the mantle and continue where his master left off. But he decides to do things in his own way. He discovers the spiritual gifts God had given him and operates in a style that is quite different than that of his master. He steps into the prophetic role, not only using all he had learned from his master, but by harnessing the spiritual gifts God had already given him to begin the future God was calling him to. 
the ones he thought he was not ready for. Elijah's experience invites us to consider our own self-doubts, our own inadequacies, and the parts of us that have felt not ready for the difficulties that lay before us. His experience invites us to consider that God does not call people to God's work without first equipping them with what they will need to succeed. His experience invites us to know that we do not have to be greater, better, or more than those who have been part of shaping us and molding us. We just need to know that the, that the spirit that gifted them is the same spirit that rests on us. It fills us and ignites us, not necessarily with the same spiritual gifts as our mentors, but with the spiritual capacities and abilities we will need to take on the task God calls us to. We just need to remember God chooses us too. Yes, God chooses the flawed and the uncertain. God chooses those who resist and those who do not think they are up for it. God calls on those who have failed and those who make mistakes. God uses people not just with strengths, but people with weaknesses and shortcomings too. When God has wanted something done in history, God has not used flawless and perfect people to do it. But more often, God has entrusted the task to those who are imperfect. Those with visible weaknesses and flaws. Those who are growing in their faith and those with no faith at all. It's not about a readiness for the task, for the thing that God has called us to, but it's about our willingness to try and know God will provide us with what we need, to know that our true power and strength comes from God. So if you're finding yourself in a place of transition right now, where it feels like life is just thrusting itself upon you and you're just trying to figure it out as you go. Just know you don't need to be ready to take the first step or even the next step. Sometimes the best we can do in these moments is cling tightly to what we've been taught, to what we know to be true. Just try to move forward. We don't have to try to fill someone else's shoes. We just need to step into the ones God has given us. We don't have to pick up where someone left off, but carry on. To know in those moments, if God has not abandoned those in need, God's not going to abandon us. To know if God can choose the most uncertain of people to do great things, God can still choose and use us to do great things too. If you walk away with anything today, no, we don't need to be ready. We just need to be willing. We don't need to be ready. We just need to know God will give us what we need. Amen. Yeah.
dare to claim the promise of your love. Though the day may not yet be here, we trust it soon will be when your children will be free. Oh, may
Thank you, Joanne. We were going to share that song with you guys a couple weeks ago. Um, we weren't able to make that happen, so uh, today was the first day we were able to do that. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, now is our time of prayer and meditation. Use this time of prayer to reflect and meditate on the joys and concerns of your heart. If comfortable, you may close your eyes and listen to the pastoral prayer today as a meditation. Center us now, O oh God, on you and your presence in this place. Among your people, as we lift our heart's desires, our soul's deepest needs, our hungers, fears, and failures. At times we have failed to be obedient, to live as your disciples and as your church in the world. We pray that you will help to guide us and enliven us to do the will and work of Christ. Open us to Spirit's urgings and awaken us to live faithfully as your people in a changing, often hurting world. We pray for those around us who need your care and ask that you would make us instruments of your healing, peace, and justice. We pray especially for those we have named to you this day and others we lift to you in the silence of our hearts. Reveal your presence to them and to us. God of life. So as people of renewed faith and vitality, we may be empowered to serve your world, building your kingdom here on earth. We offer our prayers and our lives in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns now and forever. Amen. Join me in an alternative version of the Lord's Prayer. Eternal Spirit, life giver, pain bearer, love maker, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe, the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your kingdom of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread that we need for today, feed us. For the hurts we inflict on one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and tests, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you, you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> spiritually nourished by today's worship service, I want you to consider, I want to encourage you to consider making a tithe or donation to support the work and ministry of the church. Last week we received a total of $248 to support the work and ministry of the church. Please visit our website to see the multiple ways that you can give to the church during this time, such as through PayPal, Facebook, or by simply writing a check to the church. Love is a powerful force in the world, stronger than hatred or fear or greed. The love of Jesus inspires us and invites us to share generously the gifts we have received from God. Our gifts are one way that we love one another and the world around us. 
the world God loves. Let us be generous with our giving as our God has been with love, with mercy, and with the many gifts poured into our lives. Join me in a unison prayer of dedication for all we will receive. Loving God, you know the heart of every giver. Bless them for all that they do and in the many ways they share the diversity of their gifts. Use what was shared this day to awaken the Christ within our neighbors, to provide hope and inspiration to those who need it, and to move us toward living as your church in our community and world. To this we give and pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is Spirit of God Descend Upon My Heart, verses 1 through 4, number 290 in the New Century Hymnal in the back of your worship bulletin.
after our worship service today, please stay for a few announcements. Whatever transition might be coming up in your life, or whatever unexpected life event occurs next for you, know that you don't have to be ready for it, or even feel ready for it. All you must do is be willing to show up. And know God is going to give you what you all you will need to get through it. And in the process, you just might discover and develop your own God-given gifts and capacities. Ones you never knew or even thought existed within you. Till we meet again, may the Spirit of Christ be with you all. Aloha.